Good afternoon and welcome to today's CME activity. There is no commercial support and the speakers and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. You will receive a SurveyMonkey link after today's activity. If you're viewing online, the evaluation link will be listed in the description section of the video and if, or in the uh, chat section if you're viewing this um, live. It is my pleasure to introduce Drs. Parker and Timbalay. Dr. Brittany Parker is a family medicine physician with Northeast Georgia Physicians Group and is trained in surgical and advanced obstetrics. She practices in Gainesville, Georgia in both inpatient and outpatient settings and serves as a core faculty for the Northeast Georgia Medical Center Family Medicine Residency Program. Outside of training and teaching residents and taking care of patients, she and her husband are very busy with their children's activities and traveling. Dr. Timbalay is a board certified family medicine physician within Northeast Georgia Physicians Group and specializes um, and has a special interest in obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Timbalay comes to Northeast Georgia Physicians Group by way of West Virginia, where he's worked for the past few years. He earned his medical degree from Ross University School of Medicine. He went on to complete his residency in family medicine at West Virginia University, Rural Family Medicine in Ranson, West Virginia, where he also completed a fellowship in maternal child health. Join me in welcoming Drs. Parker and Timbalay. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Tambale. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the first portion of the presentation, and then we'll have Dr. Parker kind of finish, it up, finish, finish us up. And then uh, we'll have some opening section for a few questions that we have, uh, and then we'll go from there. So uh, our presentation mainly is going to be an overview of suboxone usage in opioid use disorder during pregnancy. Um, during our residency, that's one thing we were trained on, is just kind of how to help manage those pregnant women who are dealing with addiction, addiction from opioid usage uh, and so forth, and that's gonna help not only their pregnancy, but also follow them up on the postpartum phase to kind of make sure that uh, they're, they're doing good on that, on that regard. Uh, these are some of the overview, that objective that we wanna gonna be uh, going over, uh, and then let's go jump right into it. Uh, from an epidemiology standpoint, um, so how bad is the problem? Uh, there's some study that show uh, back in 2019 about 5.7 million people admitted using opioid at some point in their lifetime. And also um, between the year 2010 to 2017, there were about 130% increase in the uh, diagnosis of opioid use disorder in, at the delivery. So we can see how the more opioid is becoming uh, a, 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 an endemic pretty much in our society, it's kind of pervasing all of our patient population pretty much. Between that same time period, we also saw that the opioid drug overdose rate, mortality rate uh, among those pregnant patients kind of skyrocketed uh, to almost 81%. So this is a real problem there. Um, the national data also showed that those patients uh, that had a diagnosis of opioid use disorder during delivery, at delivery that is, uh, were 5.6, no, 4.6 times more likely uh, to have uh, death uh, during that hospitalization. They were also about 3.5% uh, 3.5 times more likely to have some type of cardiac arrest and also were twice as likely to have either stillbirth, uh, um, preterm delivery, increased uh, risk of C-section and also needing some blood which resulted from postpartum hemorrhage. As the mom also were being affected by the opioid crisis, the baby uh, that were being born were also uh, affected and uh, we saw this with the jump in the neo, uh, neonate uh, opioid withdrawal syndrome that increased between the year 2000 to the year 2016 from 1.2 per thousand to almost 8.8 .8 per thousand. Uh, benefits of medication for opioid use disorder. So there's been a lot of studies out there uh, that kind of just kind of show, demonstrated that it's been beneficial to medically treat patients. But what I pretty like much uh, was this article that came out of JAM, I believe, back in 2020, right before we got into the pandemic. And what they did there, they had a patient population sample of about 41,000, if I'm not mistaken. And they looked at the different treatment options that we had as far as uh, treating patients with opioid use disorders, mainly sub uh, methadone, buprenorphine, um, uh, detoxification therapy, 
um, what was the other one? Psychosocial th uh, therapy as well, whether it be inpatient, uh, also outpatient. And they compare it to the, 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 uh, the baseline, which was mainly just no treatment per se. And what I found in those studies was very interesting, but also kind of concurrent with what we've been kind of seeing and be seeing some, some of the previous studies, that there was about a 70% reduction in overdose at those, with those patients that did receive either methadone or buprenorphin at the three months mark after those event occurred. And that did slightly drop to 60% at the 12 months uh, mark, but this was still significant compared to the control. The other thing that they also saw, they, they measured this uh, parameter that they called um, 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 serious opiate-related um, acute care vi uh, visits, uh, which they define as you know, any emergency room visit or inpatient hospitalization with opioid use disorder as the primary diagnosis. And among those patients that did replace the buprenorphine or more, more, uh, methadone, there was about a 30% relative risk re uh, reduction on serious opioid-related acute, acute care uses at the three-month mark. And we slightly dropped to 26% uh, at the 12-month mark, which was still, still very significant. Some of the finding was, I think that's where we can make the most difference. It was, it showed that only about 12% of those patients that uh, uh, actually were diagnosed with opioid use disorder. Only about 12% of that patient population did receive treatments there uh, with either buprenorphine or methadone, with the remaining of them uh, getting the other uh, treatment that we know of, which is uh, either detoxification therapy or psychosocial uh, uh, treatments there, which both were found to be as equivalent to our control, which was no treatment at all. Uh, individual who also received those, be the methadone or buprenorphine, were found to be for a period more than six months. That is, they were found to be have more li more likely to have less uh, um, uh, overdose and also uh, less opioid related um, serious acute um, care visits there. So the goal was also they were trying to convey that that this was a long term long term game as opposed to a short term. Uh, approach that we had most of the time with the detoxification therapy alone. So we're going to go into some of the pharmacology there. Uh, this is just a quick re uh, review there. Uh, we have our full uh, agonist, which usually will bind to the receptors um, uh, and also elicit the biochemical response in the dose-dependent manner. You have your antagonist, which kind of does the opposite, but it binds the receptors. Uh, however, it does not really generate any biochemical uh, response. Uh, this is why your naloxone and your natrexone will come into play. And we have buprenorphine, which is our partial agonist there, which that they do kind of bind to the receptors, uh, but um, the response that they elicit is a lot lesser compared to the full agonist. And as opioid, we know there's multiple receptors as far as opioid is concerned, uh, with the most prominent being the mu receptors. So most opioid available, they kind of react to the mu receptors that we were talking about there. Uh, also, buprenorphine also target that receptor in particular. Activation of the mu receptors uh, can result in analgesia, does result in analgesia, euphoria, respiratory depression. Of course, you have your nausea, your vomiting, your uh, constipation due to gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal motility uh, decrease, and of course, the dependence aspect of the drugs. We also have some other receptors that kind of play a part in the, uh, the analgesia and the dysphoria, but none of them to the, to the level of the mu receptors. Uh, a brief history there, uh, just to kind of create, give credit to Dr. Donald Jaliski, who was the first one to document um, uh, buprenorphine usage uh, for opioid dependence. Um, and ever since after him, there was multiple study that came out to just kind of agree with what was some of his findings there. Uh, for this graph here, uh, I just kind of picked it to kind of illustrate what we were talking about from uh, uh, agonist versus partial agonist versus antagonist there. And you can see how uh, buprenorphine, which is a synthetic opioid, um, um, kind of elicits some of the effect, but none of them compared to the full agonist, which is the heroin or fentanyl and all the other opioids there. Um, what else about here that I wanted to talk about? Ch -ch 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 -chew. We'll talk about this in the following slide, actually. So benefits of the buprenorphine. So we have fewer withdrawal 
uh, uh, physical withdrawal that is. Uh, longer duration, so it's a long acting medication. That's just because of this characteristic. It tends to bind to the receptors and just kind of stick to the receptor a little bit longer, which is exactly what we want to prevent those highs and lows that some, that some of those patients will be getting while they're using other opioids uh, out, that they found out in the street. There's a lower potential for misuse uh, than other substitution, uh, particularly considering if you compare buprenorphine and methadone. From us providers, I think that's something we always want to see. We want to kind of see that have some level of control to the, the and also minimize uh, the, the potential for misuse there, do no harm as usual. So, so buprenorphine is a good ag agent simply because of that property in itself. Okay. Um, as a partial agonist, we talked about it, does not provide any of the high that you get with morphine or other uh, opioid or fentanyl per se, which is exactly the desired effect. The goal is to, you know, have patients to kind of attend that steady state where they're not too high, where they're like, you find them somewhere in the hallway, uh, passed out because of how much dose of, uh, of your opioid they just ingested or, uh, injected themselves, uh, to a level, a steady state that allows them to be good, functional member of society, good parents, good mom, and so forth. Uh, it can be used for both maintenance and detoxification, but like I said in our previous article, we found that detoxification, as far as preventing the, 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 the risk of over, um, uh, over, <laughs> opioid, um, Overdose, there we go. That, as far as preventing the risk of, decreasing the risk of overdose and also the risk of serious opioid related um, acute visits, it did not really show any significant difference in the control, which was no treatment. It can help prevent the withdrawal syndrome of, syndrome of uh, opioid use disorders. Uh, again, because it's a partial agonist, it just kind of helped that patient kind of mellow through the withdrawal phase so the symptoms are not as severe as somebody who's being caught cold turkey. Uh, so there are some withdrawal from buprenorphine in itself. That's for later on, let's say two, you know, one, two years down the road, you want to, that patient want to try to kind of get off the medication. Uh, there will be some withdrawal, but those withdrawal are a lot milder uh, than uh, any of the other opioids. But one thing I really want to emphasize here is that we, you know, we, we, the previous mindset was to try to get the patient out of the medication as soon as possible, as opposed to. The, the, what the evidence are showing that keeping on the patient on the medication may actually be more beneficial because the end goal is not so much to get patient out of the, the medication, but it's more of source for the patient to become very uh, good uh, functioning member of society per se. I, I'm, at, I'm much better off having that patient be on methadone, being able to hold a job, being a good spouse, being a good parent, as opposed to running the risk of you know, getting that patient off the medication and, uh, and then uh, having that patient uh, 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 go into relapse and then ending up reusing some of the other stuff that are outside on the street. Uh, some of the other property of buprenorphine uh, has the ability to block the effect on concurrent administration of opioids, which reduce the risk of relapses. So that's another benefit there because I have some craving and ended up inoculating themselves. Um, the, they may not necessarily have that experience, the same high they were looking for. Hopefully, that will kind of you know, deter them from going that route. We already talked about the bell shape response uh, so, and also the duration of it. Um, buprenorphine also has high receptor affinity and slow dissociation from its receptor. That's exactly what we want because not only <laughs> it competes with agonists, let's say somebody was to go ahead and uh, inject themselves with the uh, full agonist, whether it be heroin or, or whatnot. Buprenorphine, because of its nature, not only will compete from a number to number uh, based on those chemicals, but also the fact that it's able to bind uh, tightly to the receptor that also will make, uh, will kind of further enhance his deterring ability and preventing that patient to experience that high. Um, there are some possibility of abuse with buprenorphine. Uh, there have been cases of injection as well, so that's where the naloxone addition comes into play. Um, the naloxone that you know that we give in addition to the buprenorphine when you come to the film or the pill does not get absorbed, uh, but it get smaller, small percent get absorbed. But that absorption itself is not enough to cause uh, uh, any active withdrawal from the buprenorphine itself. However, you can see how if the patient was not in act actively withdrawing 
that small absorption can cause problem for that patient and precipitate the withdrawal. Uh, this graph here, I liked it because it kind of shows us the emergency, opioid related emergency department visits there. And we can see how buprenorphine was very low down the road there. So it's, it can be abused, but there are definitely much cheaper, much better agents out there that are able to kind of, uh, the, the, those patients can kind of go for as opposed to trying to get high on the buprenorphine. Uh, diversion risk, that's something I like to talk about simply because you know, it's not a wonder drug, you know, anything that we do has its possible, possible side effects as well. So there has been documented uh, parental use as we talked about. Uh, most of the mis misuse has been you know, in heroin drug user that trying to crush the, com the pills or even melt the film and inject it to the self. Of course, this is a, be a part, ongoing portion of the education uh, before starting patient on the medication to kind of let them aware of those simply because of the risk of abscesses and infection that's related to the, that method of inoculation. And one of the ways to kind of prevent it like, is by adding the naloxone. So because although it may not be absorbed uh, sublingually uh, as much, um, but inoculating them, that subnaloxone can kick in and kind of uh, prevent them from abusing it that way. But again, education is very important because the patient is now well versed when it comes to those medications so they may not think about it like that. So already kind of talking about it ahead of time will help prevent them from going that route because this is something that we already discussed. Uh, here's come Suboxone. Uh, this is what we kind of use in my program. Um, it's a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. Uh, it's taken sublingually. Uh, most of the time we did the film uh, bottom there it talks about how about only about eight to ten percent is absorbed uh, sublingually. Okay, so it's very poor absor absorption. But that eight to ten percent, although may be very mild, it's very important to for the patient to be in active withdrawal in order to start this medication because that ten percent alone, if there is some active ongoing opioid in the patient's system, is able to, that's able to put the patient in active withdrawal and making this problem worse. Um, this right here, just kind of a little bit more into uh, suboxone per se. Um, administer sublingu sublingually, which is the peak concentration at 90 to 100 minutes. Uh, the time frame is very important, particularly for us because we did the outpatient induction. So we, it allow us to schedule when we did those induction and give us enough time to observe those patients. So let's say if the clinic goes at 5.30, you may not want to start an induction at 3, simply because it doesn't give you enough time to, um, to observe that patient and make sure that the, the induction process is going smoothly. Um, the effect lasts about 12 hours. It was 4 to 8 milligrams and about 48 to 72 hours. The dose is higher than that. The maximum dose is about 32 milligrams. Um, Steady state equilibrium is achieved at three to seven days. Again, when we start talking about that induction, those time frame kind of matter. Uh, so, and, and that's why you will see some of the close follow-up at the beginning of the induction that would kind of like, get stretched out later on. So there's a lot more stuff to do at the beginning just because you want to keep that patient safe and you want to control, control and continue to monitor them. Yes, the one we're talking about, we'll be talking about our patient. It can be done inpatient or outpatient. Uh, but the one that we're going to be talking about is mainly a patient. It does require a lot more stuff to do on an inpatient service um, because those are stuff that you, you know, uh, from where we were in the clinical care center, the outpatient would make a lot more sense for us. Okay. The withdrawal from the sub uh, the suboxone are milder. They occur by three to seven days after the last dose, uh, but they are again they are a lot milder than withdrawing from a full ag uh, 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 agonist. Uh, drug interaction, this is another very important um, uh, thing to remember, uh, simply because it kind of plays an important role when it comes to that initiation. You want to make sure you're screening your patient properly and being aware of some of the drug interaction that can occur, it's going to help kind of guide you there, kind of make sure that your patient selection is, is on par. Um, so as far from a sedation standpoint, it has an additive, additive effect uh, when you use in combination with other sedative. Uh, so sleeping aids, uh, benzos, and so forth. Um, 
There is, because of the way it's cleared out through the liver, there may be some possible uh, interaction there with other drug that been, that's been cleared for, uh, through the liver, but there's very little documentation of that. This is more of a theory just for, for, uh, for us thinking, through, thinking through, it, through it all. The biggest thing that I wanted to emphasize here, there's been some deaths associated with uh, uh, buprenorphine. But again, those were not just death reported because those patients did not just ingest buprenorphine on its own. There was cocaine and alcohol and benzodiazepine. Those are the, main, the two most common additives that kind of led to the death of those patients. Of course, tricycline and amphetamines is also some other drugs. So you want to make sure as you're screening those patients that you know, they're staying away from these drugs simply because at that time, those are already a very unreliable patient population that we're dealing with. So we being a little bit more stricter when it comes to uh, co-commitment drug usage is, is very important because uh, the, the downside can be, can be tragic. All right, so treating opioid use disorder in pregnancy. So the World Health Organization kind of recommended screening all of our pregnant patients there during the first visit and anything after. As far as drug usage, opioid usage, uh, marijuana usage, uh, you'll be surprised on how many pregnant patient think marijuana is safe in pregnancy. Uh, and my rebuttal to them is always, hey, you know, alcohol is legal, but it doesn't mean you can take it during pregnancy. So I don't see why marijuana becoming legal will make you think any difference. Um, of course, there's more study that needs to be done in that regard, but that's usually my spill with them to kind of help rationalize that with them. Um, uh, and also, you know, uh, I ask all my pregnant patients during that first OB visit, but depending on the risk factor, I may continue to ask throughout the pregnancy, depending if they have a risk factor to kind of make them prone for using. So you want to ask about current usage, you want to ask about past usage, so you have a full picture of that patient that's coming for it. The other thing that's very important to ask because pregnancy at itself has a great positive uh, outcome because most of those patients will try to do better for themselves and for the new baby. So it's a very crucial uh, point there, the life that they can be a lot more receptive to treatment and be able to change the course of their whole life and also of the children that they care, the baby that they carry. Um, a pregnant woman with obstetrical disorder should be offered uh, Medical assistment treatment consisting of pharmacological therapy with either methadone or buprenorphine, of course, Suboxone, which is buprenorphine with naltrexone, uh, and also an evidence-based behavior intervention. Okay. Um, med uh, medical assisted treatment for addiction treatment uh, programs specifically designed to pregnant person can help bridge the gap for those patients there. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the MCOT, which is the Maternal Comprehensive Opioid Addiction Program. This is a program that we ran in our residency down in West Virginia. Uh, this was pretty much like a group prenatal care for opioids, uh, with, for pregnant patients dealing with opioid disorders. So we created an environment there to kind of help kind of treat them in a, in a group setting and also uh, with the objective of promoting substance-free pregnancy and healthy, and healthy baby by offering treatment with Suboxone. Uh, this was good because it really optimized compliance with prenatal care visits. You got to think about it. Those patients were coming either weekly or bi-weekly to kind of get the Suboxone prescription. So that we took advantage of those opportunities, those time to also kind of check on them to see how the baby was doing, how the pregnancy was going. And most importantly, we had some uh, social worker in-house too and the behavioral therapist in heart that will kind of help with deal with some of the behavioral component that also were contributing to the substance usage. Um, uh, it also created a community for those women. For finally, they were in a room where with other women that were also going through what they were going through. So they were able to share with their experiences, uh, uh, had a perspective that other, other patients will not be able to provide to them because they were dealing with similar situation, when it, not only because of the drug use, the opioid usage, but also you know, home situation, social situation that kind of, kind of similar, mimicking each other's. Um, the focus was on maintenance rather than the detoxification, and most of the literature also kind of focused on maintenance. The goal is to keep those patients in therapy rather than trying to wean them off. Okay? Um, we talked about that we had a behavioral health on board. I think there was a social worker too to kind of help plug them in with like resources in the community uh, that they may have. Some of those patients found themselves in abuse homes and so forth. So just having that comprehensive approach and having all those people aboard was very beneficial. 
the, the other thing we started doing, I think that was when Dr. Parker came on board, they started extending the therapy to the partner as well. So we started treating the husbands and so forth because our approach was, you know, the more healthier we can get the home, the better off we can be, we can do for those patients there. And not only we followed them on during their pregnancy, but we also followed them on the postpartum phase. So we had patients that have been out of deliver about a year ago that was still in the program and still doing good. Okay, uh, suitability of patient for treatment. This is very important, okay? So all those patients should be opioid dependent, okay? There should be an active withdrawal. Although I'll have to say here, it depends on those. I had, you know, there are some cases where um, the patient were, had already undergone withdrawal, but they were just such a high risk of recurrence usage. So, so as long as the goal is not so much just on active withdrawal, but uh, we can start them even though they were not active withdrawal as long as there was no more opioid into the system, pretty much. Uh, no polydrug usage, and that's because we talked about the, the death, uh, the, the few death uh, events that occur with patients that kind of use uh, cocomintin drugs, mainly the benzos and alcohol. Not be alcohol dependent, not abusing benzodiazepine. All right, and, and what we did there, we started with the good patient education, so a pre-treatment consultation uh, to get a good sense of those patients because it wasn't just the patient or you abusing opioid. You kind of know, you needed to know how often they were they abusing, how much opioid were they taking, because it depends, you know. Some, somebody who's using three times a day versus somebody who's once a week, those are two different, different settings there. We emphasize the importance of uh, honesty and transparency. Uh, this is very important because we looked at it from an uh, addiction as an illness per se. So we, we, we came in with the perspective knowing the same way my diabetic patients, some of them are very compliant, some of them are <laughs> different. You gotta come with that mindset knowing, okay, there will be patients that will be relapsing. There will be patients that are not gonna be as compliant as others. So knowing that in the background kind of allow us to a little bit more strict but also large in our approach. But the importance of it, we needed that transparency to be placed so that if you use, I needed to know so I can kind of, you know, uh, uh, make plan and kind of best suit those, treat those patients and uh, care to those patients, per se. Uh, we discussed expectation. This was very important because one of you find out that one of the biggest apprehension for them was the withdrawal. So giving them good education as far as withdrawal was concerned, what, what was that they were to expect when it comes to uh, uh, transitioning for whatever it is that they were using from an opioid standpoint to sub, sub, sub zone, just to kind of let them know, you're reassuring them because that's, uh, that withdrawal will be milder and, and, and that the medication should definitely help them big time as opposed to them just going cold turkey. Of course, we needed to uh, stress the need for them to be present every visit, uh, as opposed to if they had to make plans to go out of town, they needed to let us know because we needed to kind of make sure those those were accounted into the into into the prescription to make sure they weren't running out while being out of town. So as soon as the pregnant person is diagnosed with opioid use disorder, uh, it's a responsibility of the healthcare provider to uh, discuss uh, some of the risks and benefits of, of treatments. Um, uh, some of the other things that will also help is also emphasizing the benefits because the literature is out there that patients that were dealing with opioid disorder did not receive any treatment, uh, had a poor fetal outcome, high rate of substance use, and also possibility of overdose. So this part of the education, so this was part of the education pro uh, process to really kind of emphasize that to them. Uh, the other thing that also I found it's very important is also just reassuring them from the safety of the medication. Uh, and yes, there, you know, there is no very, very minimal long-term neurologic uh, impact uh, to the fetus. But the other thing I always kind of put in perspective, it's much better, it's much better you know, than anything that we're using out in the streets, pretty much. Okay, so we can't say 100%, but it's not only the risk was very low that well, you know, there was some long-term complication for as far as brain development is concerned, but you, God knows what are the long-term consequences from using fentanyl that you picked up from the guy next door or whatnot. Uh, this was part of our cons of, uh, uh, counseling there, you know, kind of went into detail what was buprenorphine and how its effect were, um, potential adverse effect that they could be experiencing um, and also the roots of administrations there. Okay. 
as far as scheduling, so you know, we had an intake, and this was done either at the clinic setting, sometime in the emergency room or OB floor. You know, we have patients that will come to the floor out of town, or they just move from, I don't know, Florida, and then you see them there on active withdrawal. So if they were in active withdrawal, we kind of started them there, and then also gave them a follow-up in the clinic. Uh, if they were not in active withdrawal, we kind of had them to kind of show up the next day in the clinic uh, while they were in active withdrawal, so we can kind of go ahead and, and start them there. Um, at the beginning, like we say, because we have not quite yet reached that steady state, there were more frequent visits and more frequent follow-up. I believe Dr. one of our colleagues, Dr. Bautier, was actually would give his number because he was the, the point, of, uh, point of contact person and they could reach that person. We had that person that can be reached anytime. Even our social worker too, uh, were, were able to reach that person. Uh, those, those patients were able to reach them anytime they needed. After that, we can kind of stretch it out to the weekly or bi-weekly. Those were most of the time depending on uh, what was going on. If it's more riskier patients, uh, we kind of watched them and kept them a little bit on a weekly basis just to kind of keep that follow-up on a, on a tight leash and also kind of help minimize the risk of them relapsing because they were seeing us so far. Uh, we were keeping them accountable and those women, those other women were keeping them accountable. Primary care and behavioral health session are incorporated during the visit. I talked about how every time we saw them, we also checked on the fetus to make sure the baby was growing fine and that there was no other complication from the pregnancy standpoint. Uh, choo -choo 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 -choo. This one we kind of talked about how the maintenance can be achieved within the week. And that's one thing I like about buprenorphine. It was just, you know, once you start them, three, four days, we were able to reach that steady state then and just get them going. Um, fairly safe, we talked about it, although the few cases well, did occur with concomitant usage with other medication there. This is just kind of further reviewing that. Oh, this is what's important. So, so if the initiatives, what we found out with most of our patients, we started them, I think it was eight milligram uh, of buprenorphine, simply because starting them too low <laughs> were also was found to be like a deterrent to the compliance because they still experience severe withdrawal symptoms and just made them very unlikely to adhere to the therapy. So we started them either eight or 12 was most of the time that was what the basic required dose that most of them were taking. Uh, precipitated withdrawal can occur if a uh, patient's taking too much opioid that is and always, always they still are actively uh, using. So it's very important for them to be on in, uh, in active withdrawal. Uh, these are just some of the guidelines we kind of had ourselves to kind of minimize, to kind of assess who was high risk versus no, you know, what was a suitable candidate there. Of course, anybody that psychosis or medically incompetent, those were not good patients. Uh, patient with chronic pain also were not good cover, good, good patient because we, we were not just treating the addiction, with, uh, the addi addiction we were treating. The, the, the pain was also another factor which just made them not good candidate. Uh, those are some of the other medication that are contraindicated while you know, uh, using Suboxone. So we kind of uh, went over this with them as well. Okay. Same thing here. And uh, initiation therapy, I'll have Dr. Park take it from here. Yeah. Correct, correct. So, so all those patients was. So I was just asking if there was um, like a signed agreement or, because I keep seeing someone come into the office and uh, there's probably some that come in that deny their use and then others that are motivated to change. But um, you probably have a, a full spectrum of them, but you do have a commitment from them to participate in this project. Exactly. You, you know, every single one of had to sign uh, uh, an agreement to participate in this program. And as part of that signature, you know, they had some responsibility that they needed to fulfill uh, when it comes to their therapy as well. Correct. Thank and you. of course, dealing with an addic addiction is kind of, <laughs> it's kind of the nature of the illness, so you needed to have a little bit of wiggle room there and in case they were not fulfilling some of those agreements, but uh, 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 it was so, important. So are you also dealing with the addiction? Are they, are they going to a 12-step you know, program? Are they, or is it just that they're getting the medication and then they're meeting with, um, with um, like uh, uh, pregnant women to sort of be supportive and, as you said, their maintenance, not, not detoxifying or trying to get off the drug? 
Correct. Do you want to take this, Dr. Parker? I'll pass it on Dr. Parker because she can answer this too. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Parker. So as Dr. Timbelli was saying, to answer your question, um, when these women come in for intake, it's very important that you establish that relationship with them and that they feel comfortable with being honest with you if there is any other substance use. Uh, we know that um, a lot of women or uh, people who have dealt with opioid use or substance use disorders may come from you know, trauma, um, may have other related mood disorders. Uh, so it's really important to just, again, as Dr. Tamele said, the nature of the illness is they may relapse. They may be with a partner who uses, you know, it, you can't fix their environment as doctors. So um, we really just kind of talk to them. We are uh, addressing the opioid use disorder part of it. And uh, if there's concerns for, for example, methamphetamine use, then we get them set up with services um, that we may not provide, but services that specifically deal with uh, addiction to um, other substances. It's very important that the person uh, knows that um, in addition to their pregnancy-related care with a uh, provider, that they'll also be made it meeting um, with behavioral health. And when that behavioral health person does the intake, they can actually decide, hey, this person has so much going on that I actually want to meet with them weekly because I'm scared that they're going to, you know, relapse or, or um, leave the program. Um, so that's a very close hand-in-hand -hand relationship that we'll have. So I am going to take over by starting uh, talking again about the initiation of therapy um, and more so just going over that um, clinical withdrawal that we've been talking about. We use the owls and sows uh, table, which uh, will be next. Usually, um, as Dr. Timbele said, we'll start at the eight milligram dose um, if you're comfortable with it. If you're just getting started, you can start at the four milligram dose. Um, depending on the time of day or the situation, you may uh, start them at four milligrams in the morning, um, see how they're doing kind of in the evening or first thing the following morning. It's just really important to do that very close follow-up in the beginning. Um, and again, usually about 12 to 20 hours um, is where you will start to see those, that evidence of clinical withdrawal, uh, where we want the patient to be in or having no opioids at all prior to initiating. So here's the table that I was talking about. So there are some um, objective signs, um, including yawning, coughing, sneezing, uh, increased blood pressure, uh, heart rate, um, things that we typically have experienced with seeing patients in withdrawal. Um, and then some subjective signs include restlessness, anxiety, um, depression, drug cravings uh, is usually a large one. So when you're reviewing the patients uh, during induction, um, the principle of induction uh, to treatment is regular and frequent review, like I uh, mentioned earlier. It's important that uh, patients get reassurance, um, especially if they're in withdrawal. Hey, you know, we're, we're really concerned about your um, s signs and symptoms of withdrawal. We want to treat you. We want to help you. This is going to require, um, you know, frequent visits and working together, but just really reassuring that patient that our goal is for them not to be in withdrawal because if they, they feel like they're withdrawing too much, they may leave the program or may leave treatment. Um, only a doctor or a provider should be... Um, uh, authorizing dose increases. Um, and during the induction phase, that's usually uh, every one to, do to two days. Um, and then by the third dose, the patient should definitely be seen after being induced uh, with Suboxone. And then of course, um, it, it needs to be said that uh, to limit the duration of the prescription to ensure review. So you're not gonna uh, meet this patient and say, hey, here's a prescription for a week, see me next week, because um, that may be setting them up for failure uh, and going through withdrawal. So quick and safe initiation, again, four to eight milligrams uh, is where we would start at. And as mentioned, 12 to 24 hours, you would want to review to see um, if you need to incre increase some more. 
Um, usually about 12 to 16 milligrams can uh, produce blockade. Um, the maximum recommended dose is 24 milligrams, but if you uh, remember prior slides, we mentioned 32 um, because of some of the physiologic changes during pregnancy, which I'll talk about shortly. So precipitated withdrawal, again, using the owls and sows. Uh, a lot of times you'll see people with diaphoresis, um, some belly stuff, really anxious, or of course craving uh, opioids as they've been using. Um, and that usually starts about 30 to 90 or um, minutes after the first buprenorphine dose. Um, and then it can peak within 90 minutes to three hours they'll start to have less and less symptoms as uh, we titrate their suboxone dose up um, to adjust for them. However, if they are um, continuing heroin or uh, other opioid use, those symptoms may persist longer. So now a patient is finally uh, on their maintenance dose. Uh, usually a steady state equilibrium uh, does not occur until three to seven days after a dose change. Um, so it's just helpful to be aware of overshooting the dose. Um, again, that close follow-up will kind of help you gauge uh, where that person is uh, at maintenance. Again, 12 to 24, um, the maximum authorized dose is 24 milligrams. Um, and then heroin use, uh, the less use, the better treatment retention. Uh, if people are, con or are continuing to use heroin regularly, um, then that can, um, you know, affect the, the effectiveness of the suboxone or buprenorphine. So over the course of pregnancy, uh, periodic adjustments may need to be made because of the physiological changes during pregnancy. Uh, and this is typically um, gonna be done if at any point is usually in the third trimester. Um, and then also, again, um, remembering those behavioral interventions, they also may need to be increased um, as pregnancy progresses as this mom is dealing with, you know, the anxiety of becoming a mother or new mom or um, worried about the ramifications of her opioid use or being on Suboxone. It's important to really reassure the mom uh, that the dose of medication used to treat their opioid use disorder is not associated to the degree um, of neonatal, neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS that the baby may experience. Um, however, tobacco use is really associated with the degree of NAS that the baby may experience. Sometimes you'll find women who will try to self-taper themselves down and then they'll have more symptoms of withdrawal in a good effort because they, you know, think that I'm getting ready to have the baby. I don't want the baby to be in the hospital any longer. That's a longer hospitalization for me. But it's important to reassure them that there is no associated, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, increased risk of NAS with increasing the dose throughout the pregnancy. Uh, so this slide is really important um, as far as intrapartum analgesia, analgesia and pain management. When a woman on Suboxone uh, is admitted to the labor and delivery floor, it's really important um, to continue their maintenance dose and it should not be expected to treat the patient's pain. Um, patients, of course, because they have had opioid use disorder, are at risk for hyperalgesia. Um, um, so they may relieve, receive, I'm sorry, um, insufficient pain relief from the standard things that we would use, um, including NSAIDs, uh, Tylenol, or short-acting um, opioids. Um, and they, that means that during labor and delivery, they may um, be required uh, to receive higher doses to address their pain. It's really important to start talking about labor and delivery with these patients prior to them getting to labor delivery if they're seeing so they can, or I'm sorry, if they're being seen. Um, so everyone can have, you know, managed expectations of their pain relief. Um, lots of women will opt for an epidural, um, so early epidurals are fine. Um, you know, we'll talk about them, especially during inductions. Patients will say, can I get my epidural now? So I'm not, you know, having more anxiety about, anxiety about if my pain is being treated. Um, and that's usually something that we'll talk about. 
Morphine, fentanyl, and Dilaudid are still reasonable options for acute pain during um, labor and delivery patients with opioid use disorder. It is very important to remember that Stadol, uh, Nubane, and um, Pentosaquine, which are not um, in the U.S., um, should not be um, given to these patients. Sometimes we uh, providers will feel like, well, they last longer for pain, so they should be given to these patients so they're not in so much pain, but it can actually um, precipitate uh, opio acute opioid withdrawal. Not fun for a patient to be in labor and also going through withdrawal. So we really uh, make sure that we just... Uh, I used to just take it off the order set uh, to make sure that these patients weren't um, getting, I'm sorry, weren't getting uh, those medications. If they're having a planned labor or a planned C-section, they can also continue their maintenance dose. Uh, sometimes it is helpful to, um, what I would do for my patients is set them up with the anesthesiology before labor and delivery if, if they had any concerns. Um, about either their C-section or their epidural and how their pain would be managed. Uh, again, so that multidisciplinary approach so everyone could have uh, realistic expectations. For postpartum care, um, it's important that a new mother with opioid use disorder uh, be, cream, be screened, I'm sorry, for comorbid mental disorders before discharge from the hospital and again at the postpartum appointment. This is pretty standard, but it's really important. Remember, a lot of these patients will have comorbid um, mental health disorders and may not come from the best of environment. So now delivering this baby that they've been caring for in their belly and could keep safe, um, could risk more anxiety for the mother as she prepares to take this baby home. Um, social services may be involved. Uh, so we want to make sure that we screen and sometimes we'll have the behavioral health uh, consultant come and speak with the mother um, on multiple days of her postpartum hospitalization if she's in the hospital um, to make sure that she's set up. Uh, we do counsel regarding contraception and make sure they have immediate uh, easy access to their contraceptive of choice uh, prior to discharge. Um, and we really don't, as Dr. Timbelli was mentioning, uh, we really don't it's more towards maintenance now. We're not in a rush to discontinue them from their maintenance, especially um, in the immediate postpartum period. So if, I'm, if a, a person wants to um, consider it later, that's fine, but uh, it's usually recommended that if you're gonna start talking about discontinuation, you wanna make sure that the mother is in a stable environment, um, You know, social ser services, um, have been pretty stable. She's feeling good. She's feeling ready. Not, you know, at one week old when the baby's crying every two hours and needs to be fed and throw breastfeeding on top of that. That can be really stressful uh, for the mother. So as far as infant care in NAS, uh, NAS is a drug withdrawal symptom that may result from chronic maternal opioid use during pregnancy. Uh, it is an expected but treatable condition seen in 30 to 80% of infants born to women taking opioid agonist therapies. Uh, and it can be characterized by uh, GI disturbances, some autonomic and central nervous uh, system disturbances, which can be um, irritability, a high-pitched cry, uh, poor sleep, um, and poor feeding due to uncoordinated sucking reflexes. Uh, infants exposed uh, to Suboxone who develop NAS will usually develop it within 12 to 48 hours of birth um, and usually will peak at 72 to 96 hours and by seven days uh, is resolved. Um, with methadone, that can be just add a few hours and days to that. Um, there's a lot of evidence recently that indicates that other substances, especially nicotine, um, some SSRIs and definitely benzodiazepines can in increase the risk and severity of NAS. So during all of this, we're also counseling on tobacco use, especially for those moms who are really concerned about NAS, uh, help them with uh, tobacco use. Um, and then with their SSRIs, it's usually that risk benefit. If it's keeping their mood stable, then we'll keep them on and just prepare um, for what NAS may look like. I've treated, um, or not treated, but I've delivered and taken care of numerous newborns who did just fine. Um, uh, with the appropriate 
um, care uh, postpartum that did not need any uh, treatment for NAS. As far as breastfeeding, it's really important to counsel the woman that they are encouraged to continue breastfeeding while on their Suboxone. Um, if it's appropriate, of course, um, it may be contraindicated if they have active um, hep C, bleeding or crap, cracked nipples with hep C, HIV. Um, so the, the standard contraindications to breastfeeding stand. But if it's appropriate, we want them to breastfeed. Um, it helps with holding, uh, or I'm sorry, holding the infant closely helps with bonding um, for mom and baby for her, you know, to get that bond to encourage her to continue on with maintenance. Um, and we've seen that infants uh, born to mothers who received MAT uh, during pregnancy had no more problems uh, with certain developmental tasks than those from just a normative sample of children of mothers without SUD um, after you control for compounding factors. So, of course, breastfeeding takes the lead again as it's really beneficial for these moms and these babies. As I mentioned before, there are um, majority of women uh, with OUD do have a history of sexual assault, trauma, uh, or domestic violence, or may come from uh, abusive homes or homes where caregivers uh, have used drugs. So depression and other psychiatric disorders are gonna be more common in this population it's really important that they follow up with behavioral health point, um, appointments. And again, there's a risk benefit if they're having severe depression or bipolar disease and manic episodes. We want to treat them, um, treat that because we can kind of control the, the outside part um, once baby is outside with the NAS. Um, and Again, in the third trimester with those increased physiologic changes, those medications may need to be adjusted as well. So just something to keep an ear out for. So once a patient is finally ready to discontinue pharmacotherapy, um, it needs to be her choice. Um, and you know, you just kind of counsel them with it. I usually go through the pros and cons. Um, my favorite is what if uh, scenario. So. What if your four-year-old is kicking your back seat and your baby's crying and, you know, your milk is leaking all over the place? Are you going to be encouraged to use or, you know, during your um, behavioral health sessions, did you learn the appropriate coping strategies to help you? Uh, if a mom, <clears throat> excuse me, feels that uh, she is ready to discontinue, um, it is usually generally achieved after at least a year. Um, and we also want them to be done with uh, breastfeeding. The longer the patient is on uh, treatment for OUD, the lower their risk of returning to substance abuse when she eventually chooses to taper. Um, so they are gonna have a, again, poor prognosis if they're still using or if they're going through poor psychosocial functioning um, or if they get pregnant again, we just kind of talk to them and, and see when they want, when they feel ready. So withdrawal symptoms are usually milder and less protracted, uh, usually about one to three uh, days after the last dose. They may peak about three to seven days after the last dose, um, and they may have symptoms for two to four weeks. Um, the dose reduction can be made faster and is um, usually more comfortable than methadone withdrawal. Um, and, uh, you know, you just kind of taper the dose kind of how, as you work with your patient, it's very individualized on how you feel. You know, some people will cut it in half if they feel like um, that's reasonable. A lot of the dosing is either BID or TID dosing. So we may drop a dose for a week and see how it goes. It really, there's no standard of how you're gonna do that dose reduction. But after uh, they're done with reduction and withdrawal, it's important to maintain several contact with them, check in with them. Usually we'll have our, so our social worker um, check in with them, make sure they're still doing okay. And then just consider oral naltrexone, uh, which is a full antagonist uh, treatment if they're still having some just mild symptoms. And again, this is just a table that can be helpful. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it that way, but um, it's just one way that you can reduce the dose uh, from their daily dose. So, of course, we have to talk about when a patient would be dismissed from the program or dismissed from the practice. Uh, we really, really try our best 
to keep these patients and work with them and understanding that this is an addiction and an illness, relapses will happen. Uh, but we like to establish that rapport and that trust in making sure that they are honest with us. You can work with an honest patient and help them get the resources that they need. Uh, but when they're dishonest, um, they're consistently failing drug screens, meaning that we don't see any buprenorphine in their system on multiple occasions and you're concerned about diversion, uh, we usually have a discussion with them. And if we want to keep the patient in our practice or in our program, um, it may result in I don't like to say it's punitive, but to ensure the safety and the, of them and others will do more frequent visits. So they may have to do daily visits um, or every other day visits or check-ins to make sure that they're on the right track. Um, if a patient consistently struggles to remain abstinent um, and they just might need a higher level of care, uh, then we may again, move them to more frequent visits, um, or they may have to go to some recovery meetings, or they may just need to transfer to like an inpatient um, program or a program that can just give them the tools that they need. But it's really important when they're having these issues is again, what is the root of this issue? Is it trauma at home? Is it, um, you know, an abuser, the, the, the uh, baby's fa father who may be, you know, encouraging these things we really try to make sure we surround that mom with all the resources that we that she needs before um, she is dismissed um, and then you know if they are dismissed we of course give them all the resources that are in the uh, in the area um, that we think that would be beneficial to them um, and then they all get a prescription for Narcan uh, just to be safe and lastly, just some barriers to treatment that I want you to go home and, or if you're at home, I just want you to think about. Um, only 56 to 60 percent of pregnant people with opioid use disorder um, uh, will take and receive treatment if it's available to them. Um, there are some sy significant systemic barriers that pregnant people will face in uh, seeking and receiving treatment for OUD, um, which is more prevalent, especially in women of color. Uh, one is, you know, patients will be concerned about the stigma of not just the healthcare community, um, but the community in general uh, associated with taking MAT during their pregnancy. So it's really important that as providers that we are, um, um, you know, not uh, having any biases against biases. I'm sorry against these women on you know, why they're taking Suboxone uh, during the pregnancy. It's important that they got the Suboxone in the first place to take care of their pregnancy and care for their child. Uh, patients may be worried, of course, about the legal system, which may penalize pregnant people who disclose their substance use to their provider when seeking help. Um, and then the, the, the potential for the child welfare system involvement uh, of, as far as removing the child from the home or, you know, if they find out that CPS um, or I'm sorry, if they're worried that CPS is finding out about their uh, Suboxone use, they may just not want to be on it at all. Again, during the pregnancy, these are all things to talk about and assuring, you know, a mother, yes, CPS will be involved. We have social work involved, so we make sure that things are set up for you to go home and there shouldn't be any punitive action uh, for you receiving MAT during this pregnant pregnancy. Uh, so there's a couple of questions um, that we can go over. And I believe there are some also on SurveyMonkey. Correct. Uh, so those are on the slides for you. Thank you so much Thank for you having so us. Thank you so much. Thank you.